The program you are about to see is based on a war game developed with the help of military experts and advisors. Its purpose is to inform, not to alarm. You will witness a series of events reported by the evening news on television. A series of events that could lead us to the brink of World War III. At this moment, flying over the United States is a military airborne command plane. It is a communication outpost for the President and Strategic Air Command. It is capable of transmitting orders to U.S. forces across the world during a nuclear confrontation. Its code name is Looking Glass. A terrorist bomb in Saudi Arabia today took the life of American Ambassador Gabriel Seaton and killed four others at the United States Embassy. For a report on this, the latest in a series of startling developments in the Middle East, we hear from Michael Boyle at the U.S. Embassy in Jeddah. The bomb exploded in a pantry next to the kitchen on the ground level. The blast tore away a whole corner of the building all the way to the roof above the fourth story. Ambassador Seaton was in his third floor office on the same corner and was apparently killed instantly. Three other officials also died in the attack. Ironically, security at the embassy was tightened only yesterday in response to a wave of violence in the region triggered by America's banking crisis. The United States calls on the government of Saudi Arabia to take immediate action to apprehend and punish the terrorists who committed this crime. The ambassador's death climaxes several days of turmoil in the Middle East that were ignited by the bank crisis here at home. It's been years since Americans have lived through such an astonishing week. Five days ago, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, forming a debtor's cartel, defaulted on their loans. That caused the failure and collapse of three American banks. Within 24 hours, panic and speculation throughout the country led to the withdrawal of more than three billion dollars. That forced the White House to close the banks, to put a halt to all banking transactions. But Americans have found it hard to be separated from their money, and the bank crisis, now in its fifth day, continues to cause eruptions of violence. Barry McKay reports from New York. This was the scene this morning at the National Mercantile Bank. Local depositors, responding to a rumor that the bank will be open again for normal business, stormed the doors in a futile attempt to be reunited with their money. The National Mercantile was one of three banks that failed because of the South American loan defaults. The patience of these citizens, as well as their cash, is rapidly becoming exhausted. In the highly complex arrangements of international finance, the impact of our bank crisis continues to be felt throughout the world, particularly among the oil-producing countries of the Middle East. Soviet-backed guerrillas toppled the government of Oman after it had lost $700 million of its national treasury, which had been invested in an American bank. And now, the turmoil has spread to Saudi Arabia with the bombing of the embassy and the death of our ambassador. Well, it's a national policy premise that the Persian Gulf and its oil resources are vital to the Western world, to our allies in Europe and the Pacific. We're not likely to back away from that policy now. But it's a threat of civil war in Saudi Arabia, the biggest, richest, and closest Arab friend of the U.S., that could mean calamity to American interests in that region. This afternoon, the White House issued a statement saying the administration will, and I quote, wait and see before planning to issue script to take the place of currency during the bank shutdown. Observers here take that as the first hint that the bank holiday may not last as long as once predicted. A Defense Department announcement just now released says that a United States Central Command contingent landed earlier today in Saudi Arabia. This move, estimated to be the largest United States military operation since the Vietnam War, has taken much of the nation and the world by surprise. This action, the Pentagon said, is a peacekeeping initiative made in response to King Fahd's request for U.S. help after rebellious units of his own army occupied the sacred city of Mecca. CBN's Michael Boyle landed with the U.S. forces. Paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division began landing shortly after dawn. American troops are on the Arabian Peninsula. This is very much a combined operation. 
The Army, the Air Force, and the Marines all have units here. How many? The answer to that question, at this stage at least, is classified. In 1983, I watched the Grenada invasion from a boat offshore, and I know this is a much larger force. An hour or so ago, we watched the delivery of at least a dozen Lance missiles, and also an unknown number of M110 howitzers. Both weapons are nuclear capable, but no one here is saying much about that. Earlier today, United States Marines landed on the shores of the Red Sea, a few miles south of the city of Jeddah. A scene reminiscent of last year's showdown in Lebanon, but on a much larger scale. As to why all this is happening, Colonel Howard Anderson gave this somewhat understated explanation. I have a prepared statement, gentlemen. United States combat forces, at the invitation of the government of Saudi Arabia, will take and hold defensive positions at agreed upon locations. The forces will assist in re-establishing public order and deterring aggression against the people of Saudi Arabia. That's it. Well, but can this be seen by the Soviet Union as anything other than a provocative act? It should not be seen as provocative by the Soviet Union. We've told them repeatedly, during the Carter administration, for example, that in the event of trouble in the Gulf that interfered with the flow of oil, we would commit American military forces. We have a stake in the stability of the area, and that preservation of stability in the area does not threaten the vital interests of the Soviet Union. The official Soviet news agency TASS today characterized the American deployment of troops in Saudi Arabia as a grave act of provocation against the Saudi people and a blatantly imperialist action to prop up the corrupt puppet government of King Fahd, unquote. According to the standards set by the peace movement during the Vietnam War, this was hardly a demonstration at all. But as one of the organizers here reminded me, that movement began small also and had a decade to build up steam. They're going to tell us about dominoes and all of that stuff, but this time the American people aren't going to buy it. I lost a son in Lebanon. There hasn't been anybody yet who's been able to tell me what he died for. Don, this is the biggest crisis to face the Western Alliance since either the Bay of Pigs or the blockade of Berlin. We see radical governments taking over in the Middle East. We see a threat to the very lifeline for Japan and Western Europe. We have our friends, people who've been with us, asking for our help. And I think that we in America have to make the decision. If we're going to remain a world power, if we're going to hold together the Western Alliance, we have to be capable of staying in places that are in trouble in order to preserve that alliance when it's under. From the Soviet standpoint, they would love to have the oil fields. There is a two or three hundred year history of the Russians back through the czars trying to seize this part of the world. For two centuries, the British stopped them. We are now in the unenviable but real position that it's either the Americans there protecting freedom and helping the Western Europeans and the Japanese and keeping the free world alive, or in fact, the Soviets will take the fields. Do you think that the Russians are going to be tempted by this reduction of NATO forces in Western Europe? Don, in my own opinion, no. Not in Europe for the simple reason that any move on their part would bring us solidly back into that region. Well, do you think that the Kremlin feels its hand is being forced by these events? Who knows? But the ante has been up, and now it's their turn. American soldiers keep the vigil in a distant desert, and no doubt wonder where it all will end. The Persian Gulf is the center of turmoil again today, as the Soviet-backed government of Oman has imposed a toll on all oil ships entering the Strait of Hormuz. This toll has effectively created an economic blockade with giant oil tankers waiting at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, uncertain what to do next. Those empty tankers out there are waiting to pay $10,000 a piece for the privilege of passing through the Strait of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf. Oman's new governing council announced the toll midnight last night. Omani patrol boats have been out all day intercepting tankers and escorting them here. Western diplomats are already calling the toll a Soviet-engineered retaliation against the United States for sending troops into Saudi Arabia. Reaction in Washington was swift. In harsh language that recalled the darkest days of the American-Soviet relationship, the administration accused the Soviet Union of interfering with the right of free passage of ships entering the Persian Gulf. Its code name is Looking Glass.